Hello everyone, this is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and this is part three of my series, my 10 part series called The Murder of Cleopatra. And today we're going to be looking at Antony and Cleopatra. All right, so let me explain again how I'm doing this. This is my book, The Murder of Cleopatra. You can see it's quite long. It has a, a lot of information in here, which I can't possibly do in this show. I'm trying to give you some highlights uh, to get you to understand some of the most, mm, <laughs> the biggest myths of the history of Cleopatra and knock them down and show what you didn't see in the Netflix series, Cle Queen Cleopatra, because they, they skipped over these as well, because, well, for years, for 2000 years, I believe the story has not been told correctly. In this book, you will find a great deal of footnotes and a long bibliography supporting and all the evidence supporting each of these pieces of information that um, I'm giving you and that are in the book. But there's it's this is so much more. So I do recommend you read the book and the link is below. All right. So last time and part two at the end of that, Cleopatra had hooked up with a Julius Caesar and she had a baby. Well, she had a baby. <laughs> and as I pointed out, the chances of it being Julius Caesar's child are not so good. Uh, but he was willing to say, hey, look, I got I got a woman pregnant, which I haven't been able to do in 40 years. Um, and so she named him Caesarian. And but the problem is Julius Caesar actually never specifically recognized him as his son, nor did he put him in his will uh, to take over, you know, the future of Rome or Egypt or whatever. So that's one of the big keys to probably Caesarian, he realized was not likely his kid. So anyway, but for Cleopatra at that point in time, everything was looking good. She had hooked up with Caesar. Caesar was happy to have her rule Egypt and have that um, connection with her so he could control some, some things. He was happy about that. She was happy to have the protection of Rome because she needed that. Now, everything would be, maybe have gone on really well, except that Julius Caesar got himself assassinated. So that kind of sucked for Cleopatra because now her protector was gone. And this is why she had to hook up with Antony. So this segment is about her relationship with Antony. And also I've got a surprise for you as to what I believe actually happened uh, as far as the murder of Julius Caesar because history points out, hmm, well, the historians have said that uh, Anthony was this innocent bystander, that he really had nothing to do with what happened to Julius Caesar. And he wished that they, they kind of portray him as kind of this dolt. Um, he's just out there, he's running the army, drinking a lot, hanging out with the dudes and betting a few women here and there. And not really aware of things that are going on, you know? And um, so when Julius Caesar gets murdered, he's like, oh, how, how did that happen? And he has nothing to do with it, you see. <laughs> I, I protest that is not what I see is the truth in the matter. So uh, just, just to kind of, uh, I just want to point this out too, which is kind of just, it's amusing to me because a lot of times history is condensed, especially in two hour shows. But even so, it's like the part about Cleopatra is highly condensed in history. And this is kind of the way people think of Cleopatra. Um, this comes from my chapter 13. Here is the way, well, some people think of the history of Cleopatra. Cleopatra becomes queen. And soon Julius Caesar shows up. She beds him, has a baby, and soon thereafter Caesar is murdered. So a few months later, she hooks up with Mark Anthony and soon she has twins. And then a few month, more months later, they go off to fight Octavian Ac Actium. They lose and they run back to Egypt. A few weeks pass, Octavian shows up and both Cleopatra and Antony die. If you ask a number of people how long it was between the time Cleopatra became queen and the date of her death, they would say two hours. <laughs> I'm kidding, <laughs> the length of the film. But no, I'm joking. But seriously, some would say, well, maybe five or six years, maybe seven. So in other words, a lot of people think that the reign of Cleopatra was quite short and that she was entirely dependent on these little relationships she had with Caesar and Antony 
to get her through the, her short reign. But this is not the truth. She was actually quite a great queen and she lasted quite a while. Listen to actually the numbers here. Cleopatra was born in 69 BCE. She became queen at the age of 18 in 51 BCE. Uh, at the age of 21, three years later. So she was queen for uh, three years. And then she hooked up with Caesar in 48 BCE. Um, at the age of 25, four years later. So now uh, that's when Caesar's murdered. So after she hooks up with Caesar, there's four years that pass before he's killed. Okay, so who do you, what do you think she's doing in those four years? Yeah, she's running Egypt, right? And she's she's got the, the security of, of Caesar in Rome, but she's <laughs> running Egypt for four years. She's already been queen for three other years. So now she's up to year seven. Then after he gets murdered, Cleopatra hooks up with Antony in 41 BC. So that's three years later. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I just, uh, yeah, three years later. Okay. Now, so she runs, she's running Egypt for four years before Caesar gets killed. And she runs Egypt for three years after Caesar gets killed before she hooks up an Antony. So now we're adding in another bunch of years. She's 28 then. Then she was 28 when she hooks up at Antony. The Battle of Actium, which is what kind of did them in and led to their defeat. She was actually 38 years old. That was 31 BCE. It was 10 years later. <laughs> so after she hooked up at Antony, she ruled Egypt for another 10 years. That's a darn long time. So in all, then she died in 30 BC, the age of 39. So she was queen for over 20 years. So <laughs> she, she, she did a lot of work in 20 years of running her country. So don't think it's this condensed that she's hardly had a time to do anything. She just hooks up a bunch of guys and dies. <laughs> That's not the way it works. All right. But in this case, she's, if we go back in time now, she is with Caesar and then Caesar gets assassinated. What about Antony? All right. Let me kind of show you what is said about Antony. Now, Plutarch, who is the Dan Brown of his time, has always pointed out he's on the Roman side. He, he doesn't like Cleopatra. He, that's a, he disses uh, Caesar and he disses Antony because they both hooked up with Cleopatra. And Octavian, the other guy who's the last man, the man standing at the end of all of this and rules Rome for many, many years as pretty much dictator and emperor, he likes him. And he's writing this book, you know, in the memory of him, <laughs> shall we say. Um, so at any rate, um, so Plutarch may say Antony is not that bright and had some bad habits. And that's what he tried to say. He said that um, he said he had traits that were vulgar to some, his boastfulness and his jesting, his open indulgence in drink, his habit of sitting with the soldiers when they ate or eating standing at the common table. He was lustful, but charming. He captivated people. He helped those he loved. He said a few nice things here, but he doesn't particularly say he's very bright. Okay. So what had happened was Caesar and Anthony had actually been apart. They had a long period of separation. Caesar kind of wasn't that thrilled about Anthony. So he really, he did think Anthony, uh, you know, you, you fine, you take the troops, you go work over there. But he had some issues with Anthony. But he decided that he would let him back into his good graces as co-counsel. And Antony continued in that position for seven years until Caesar's murder in 44 BCE. So he came back to Rome. He was his co-counsel and all that. However, when Antony was given the position of co-counsel, he was 32 years old, still relatively young in comparison to Caesar. And most likely at a time in his life when being second to the great man was a good spot to be. Fast forward to Antony nearing 40. And still in that position, and we can see that midlife crisis and ambition may well have melded together and led to a lust for power that would never be achieved if Caesar remained dictator. All right. There's no question that Anthony's ambitious. People don't think he's ambitious. He hooked up with Cleopatra. Why? Because he wanted to take over Rome and with her rule Roman Egypt. He wanted the entire empire. <laughs> the guy was ambitious. All right. So now... Here's the, what supposedly happened. How did how did um, how did the murder of, Cle of uh, Julius Caesar come about? 
How did this happen? How did he get assassinated? Right? He's a very powerful man. He's running the country. Well, he's supposed to be having, you know, supposed to be a republic, but you know, hey, he's getting too much power and he's wanting to get more land and more power. And this becomes worrisome to the Romans, okay? Especially, um, especially those who are supposed to be ruling with him. So let's, let's look at what Plutarch says happened. This is what he claims happened. Um, let's see right here. Even, um, let's see, there was a The events incur these events. Um, well, these events. Uh, this is um, the events we're talking about. Is his Julius Caesar's uh, attempting to get even more power over and over, more and more power, and hooking up with Cleopatra. These events encouraged Brutus and Cassius, enlisting those of their friends who were trustworthy in the plot. They inquired about Antony. Everyone was eager to admit him. So Plutarch's saying they're going to have this plot now to kill Caesar. And they're eager to admit Antony into the plot, you see. But Trebonius opposed it. He said that at the time when many went to meet Caesar as he returned from Spain, he and Antony had traveled together and shared a tent and that he had gently and discreetly inquired about Antony's opinion. But that while Antony understood him, he did not approve of the plot. Okay, so the claim is Antony knows about the plot, you see, because somebody told him about the plot, but he didn't approve of it. But he, did, but he said nothing to Caesar, instead faithfully keeping the secret. <laughs> Wait a minute here. <laughs> right here, Plutarch's basically saying he's in on it because if he doesn't run to Caesar and say something, hey, the these guys are plotting against you. He's, even if he doesn't do anything personally, he is aware of the plot. He's not going to stop the plot. And he's probably hoping the plot will go through because that will get rid of Julius Caesar. And he thinks he's going to step into the void, that he's going to be the heir to the throne, essentially. So he instead faithfully kept the secret. After this, they thought of murdering Antony after they killed Caesar, but they didn't do that. All right, so supposedly on, on the Ides of March, this is when, let's go to, let's go to this. All right, so now we have, right here, we have, um, we have Anthony, and this is Anthony and Caesar. This is, this is a ceremony that was done. This is, all, this is written up in the book. I'm not going to get into that, but here's the Ides of March. All right, so Caesar is supposedly walking on in to the Senate. And all of a sudden, these people come and stab him to death, right? It says here what Plutarch says. Some afraid of Antony's strength and political reputation assigned several of the conspirators to watch him. So that when Caesar entered the Senate and the deed was about to be done, they might restrain him by engaging him in some urgent conversation. So the claim is <laughs> that Antony was, they said, hey, Anthony, come here. And so Anthony went, what do you, what, 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 what's up? And he went over to talk to them. And while that was happening, Caesar went on in without the protection of Anthony and they killed him. So Anthony is not inside when the murders happen. All right. <laughs> I wrote right here. Anthony may not have, have had quite the intellect of Caesar or of the future Octavian, but I find it hard to believe he is quite as oblivious as Plutarch makes him out to be. He would not have been so successful as a general for so many years, nor would he have done so well in politics for nearly a decade if he didn't have a fairly calculating mind. Um, his main downfall was kind of a drinker. He was a drinker. And, uh, and Caesar wasn't pleased with some of what Anthony was doing. He had, been, he had a power grabbing move, stealing the spoils of Pompey's estate from under him. So, and Antony had a big ego. And so he was clashing with Caesar's big ego. All right. So I think when, he, when, when Caesar brought back Antony, he thought, I'm going to bring, you know, my friends are close to me. I'm going to bring my enemies close too, so I can keep a watch on him. All right. But, but I say this. His enemies, Caesar's enemies, and in my opinion, that included Anthony, 
had to strike quickly to prevent him from achieving the goal of, he was going to go uh, off and uh, fight the Parthian campaign. He wanted to take over Parth, Par, Parth, uh, Parthia, <laughs> I guess it's Parthia. Um, and that would add to his successes and his riches and, his, and that makes him essentially emperor. Um, and they didn't want him to achieve that goal. Uh, so they wanted to prevent him from doing so and they had to strike quickly. More than 60 senators were involved in the conspiracy. So it's hard to believe that Mark Anthony had no clues what was going to happen, especially since somebody had told them what was going to happen. <laughs> and he knew, so he knew exactly when and where it was to happen. He was not ignorant of this. Had he really been in Caesar's corner and satisfied with his lot in political life, he would have run to Caesar and told him of the plan. In fact, had any of the conspirators believed that Anthony might have any misgivings about the assassination, it would be hardly make any sense that they would have brought up the subject in his company. They absolutely knew he was on their side. And whether he was the actual ringleader, as I believe he was, or just a willing co-conspirator, Anthony knew full well what the eyes of March would bring to Caesar. He liked power quite well himself, so no great empathy for Julius Caesar would stand in his way. All right. Um, so the claim here, again, is that Plutarch was detained from entering, so he wouldn't know what was happening. But I think this is ridiculous. If Anthony did not go inside, he himself did the lingering, purposely staying outside the building until the deed was done. So it would be, it makes him look like he had nothing to do with it. And then when he was standing before the people, he could say, oh, we've lost our our dear Caesar. He was my my wonderful friend and a great man. And uh you know, and they do all the honors to Caesar and people wouldn't suspect him of offing Julius Caesar. So it was a clever thing to do. So yeah, I'm going to say <laughs> Anthony was in on the plot to kill Caesar. And yet we don't hear much about this, do we? We have, we only hear that he was adult who just, everybody worked around him and he just sat there and went, Oh, that's a shame. So <laughs> So that is how I believe Julius Caesar got killed. Now, after he got killed, Cleopatra had to roll back to um, roll back to Egypt because she can't hang out there under these circumstances, right? So she's so she's so she's off in Egypt, and um, Antony has this thing going. There's this this um, uh, triumvirate thing between three guys. So what happened was. Antony thought he was going to become the heir to J Julius Caesar, and he wasn't put in the will. Julius Caesar instead put in his nephew, who was this weak little guy, almost nobody knew about this guy, and this is this is Octavian. And you can see, he look, kind of looks like a little weak boy kind of guy, and he was. He was sickly through most of his life. And people, you know, one of the things Antony always hoped and Cleopatra always hoped and others did too, that he would just die because he kept getting sick and had all these problems and, and people thought he was wimpy. And, you know, so Octavian ended up in the bigger position than Anthony and he started controlling. Um, they got rid of the guy in the middle the other guy. <laughs> so that triumvirate, triumvirate went away and there was just the two of them. He was basically, uh, Octavian was basically controlling Rome and the West and Antony was more toward the east with his troops and all that running around with the army. Now, Cleopatra, meanwhile, is back in Egypt. And she's running Egypt. And she's hoping these guys keep busy beating up on each other. <laughs> you know, as long as they don't have issues, she's not one. Okay, They don't have time to waste with Egypt under those circumstances because they're doing all their infighting, right? But... Then what happens is Antony reaches out to Cleopatra and says, hey, I want to see you. Because Antony realizes that he needs some help. He needs more power. He needs more money. He needs more ships. And she's got them. So he believes if he can hook up with her, then he can fight Octavian and he can take over. The idea is knock Octavian out of the way. And, and Julius Caesar wants all of Rome. And he'd be happy to take Cleopatra in Egypt as well. Now, Cleopatra has this decision to make at that point. <clears throat> She's like, 
okay, it seems like they're making that power play and one of them is going to win, Octavian or Mark Antony. Now, Octavian was very smart and he was very good at manipulating people and doing things that kept people he was brilliant. And so he was, he was a chess player. Let me put it that way. He played the most brilliant game of chess. Um, he, he was kind of a, lived a very um, spare life himself. He wasn't into riches. He wasn't into fancy stuff. He wasn't into drinking, but he knew how to move the people around him. He was the, on that chessboard with all his pawns and moving everything. He's a cold fish. And she's like, there's no way in God's earth. He, he never liked, her, Octavian never expressed any appreciation for uh, Cleopatra. She knew she couldn't hook up with him. It wasn't going to happen. So she only had one choice, which is Mark Antony. And Mark, Ant so she's like, okay, they're going to fight each other. And I'm, I can't hook up with Octavian. So either I just sit here by myself until Octavian, they fight it out. And if Octavian wins, they just comes and crushes me. Or I hook up with Mark Anthony and the two of us together can take down Octavian. This seems like a smarter plan. So, so what happened is uh, Mark Anthony sent for her and she went to, 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 she took her, her ship and she decked it all out and made it sumptuous and gorgeous and made herself in the, in the form of Aphrodite. And she was just, she was just spectacular. And um, so she comes with this fabulous ship, you see, and she all decked out. And what was she trying to do? She, first of all, she wanted to appear as a extremely wealthy queen, a, a, the wealthy queen of Egypt. She didn't want to come as a ragamuffin, okay? <laughs> um, just, just like about the thing about Julius Caesar, she wasn't going to roll out of any dang rug. She was going to come in as a queen so that he had respect for her. So she showed up with all her finery, all her money, the Legui Le treasury, uh, all her men in this spectacular performance. Why? Because when he saw her, he'd go, all right, she's she's powerful, she's rich, she's not bad looking either. <laughs> this could work. So then they they hooked up, and uh, then um, they hooked up. But she went back to Egypt. He he he. Mark Anthony ended up marrying Octavian's sister to try to sort of smooth things out over there, and so she was back in Egypt doing the ruling thing. But you know, time went on, and. There was a reasonable amount of time that went on, as I pointed out, um, before anything bad happened. Um, uh, Mark Anthony spent time between Rome and Alexandria. Um, he spent some time with his wife. He wasn't like hanging out full time with Cleopatra and Alexandria. That wasn't happening. She got pregnant with twins. She had them she, and she had one more with him. And uh, during all this time that she had three kids with him, she was ruling Egypt and he was busy trying to make things work with Octavian, try to keep the East, but then calculating for at some point he has her in his corner and he might then make the move. Well, somewhere along the way, and Anthony was hanging out in, in Alexandria and Octavian started using this as a propaganda campaign to, to get rid of Anthony. He's like, he's, here he is. He's, he's, hanging out in Alexandria with Cleopatra and he's got these Egyptian kids and he's hooking up. He thinks Egypt, Egypt is more important than, than Rome. And so he was trying to turn the Romans against Anthony so that they would see him as, you know, not for the Romans. He would sell the Romans out for her. That's what he, that's what he pushed. So at a certain point in time, um, uh, supposedly, you know, well, then, uh, uh, Anthony divorced uh, his, uh, Octavian's sister. He married um, Cleopatra, and they did this uh, supposedly this fancy ceremony where he basically said, "You know, we're now we're now gods and goddess and king and queen, and the kids are all they're all our, our heirs, and that includes Caesarion, and who's now going to be the next pharaoh, and and then his kids were all going to get land somewhere." And so when he did all of this stuff. Um, Octavian's like, see, guys, told you this guy's selling us out to Egypt. And so this became a point in time where they were going to have to go to war. And again, I'm sure Cleopatra was just hoping, and Mark Antony too, that <laughs> the sickly, the stupid, sickly Octavian 
would just kick off. He would just die. Or maybe one of his own men would murder him or something would go wrong, but he hung in. So Octavian survived all those years being sick. And so now they were at this crossroads. What are they going to do? So they're going to have to fight. Um, and so there, there's, a, there's a bunch of war stuff in between, which a Parthian campaign again, which didn't go well for Mark Antony. But they were now going to meet at a place called Actium. Um, Mark Antony and Cleopatra were going to get on there, take their ships, and they were going to go to Actium. Where they're, and then, they, then uh, Octavian was going to come over from Rome and meet there, and that's where they were going to have this war at sea. It's called the Battle of Actium. And so the next, um, the next episode, which is going to be part four, I'm going to talk to you, to you about the Battle of Actium, because again, this is misrepresented as just, oh, it's, it's so badly misrepresented as if Antony and Cleopatra were a bunch of dunces and, um, and that um, Antony couldn't keep his people together and couldn't fight well. And then Cleopatra in the middle of the battle just decides to hell with this. And she takes off in a ship and deserts Anthony. And Anthony goes, no, don't leave me, honey. And he jumps in his ship and he sails after her and they leave the rest of the men to die. <laughs> and Octavian wins and that's that. This is not the way it went down. It did not happen this way. And this is oddly, there's actually enough information on this to prove it didn't go down this way. And I studied the uh, military uh, methodologies of the time and the naval, how na navies worked. And I looked at the layout of the land and how all the different things that happened. And I do not understand why historians still tell this stupid story about how Anthony and Cleopatra didn't do anything right. And Cleopatra deserted Anthony, went after her like a lovesick idiot, you know? It's just so nonsensical. And that's how that's how the whole end of Egypt came <laughs> was because of, of Anthony and Cleopatra. Nah, that's not the way it went down. So tune in to uh, part four, which will be the Battle of Actium. And um, if you haven't been to my channel before, please do like and su subscribe and check out the playlists uh, to see what other cases besides Cleopatra I, I have uh, analyzed. And there's a lot of them. So. Uh, thank you for being here, and I will see you in part four. Bye.